glad that you're here to worship with us. Um, we invite you to stand and sing. We've got a new song that needs a lot of energy. So I hope you had your coffee this morning. Y'all sing with us. Starts with a chant, so y'all sing with us this morning. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. wake up on this Easter Sunday morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship at Canterbury United Methodist Church. My name is Tori Hastings. I'm the pastor here of Contemporary Worship. Delighted to be in worship with you this morning. Um, let's do this. Since it's Easter, since it's early, find someone, tell them happy Easter. I'm glad you're here. Go. As you 
finish your greetings, I'm going to invite you to be seated. Um, we've got a few video announcements to let you know of some of the big things going on in the life of Canterbury coming up in the next few weeks. Take a look. just want to tell you about our Next Steps class that is starting this next week. It is a class that is dedicated to learning about what we believe. It is a class where you get to meet other people who are new to the church. And of course, you get to meet our clergy and staff. So it is for anybody who wants to learn about Canterbury, or if you've been new and you've been visiting and you want to take the next step in membership, this class is for you. We're starting next Sunday, April 7th, 9.15 in the dining room, and the class will go on for four weeks. You can read all about it in your bulletin, or you can always email me and ask questions. Hope to see you there. There's an exciting event coming in April that all women need to know about. Enliven Women's Retreat is happening right here at Canterbury on Friday night, April 26th, and Saturday, April 27th. And we are so excited to welcome author and speaker Kathy Izzard. Kathy is an award-winning author, a phenomenal speaker, and she has helped bring transformation to countless women in her hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, in the areas of homelessness, housing and mental health. Kathy loves helping women find faith in their story through mentoring, workshops, and retreats just like ours. So check out the details down in your bulletin, invite a friend, and sign up today. There is so much going on in the life of Canterbury, so I invite you to look at the website or your bulletin or to join these things here that we have had as our announcements. Before we continue in worship, as our band has already led us, let us go to God in prayer. God, our Easter Sundays can be hectic. They can be busy with family and lunch and spending time together, and all of those are great things. But it is easy to forget that you are a God of new beginnings, sometimes a God of starting over, and certainly a God of resurrection. So give us a moment to pause, a moment to breathe in and to breathe out, to be in your presence, to experience resurrection in our own lives. So God, as we continue in worship, we pray that you would have us see what we need to see, have us hear what we need to hear in order to more fully be your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this moment, I welcome Amanda Fuller up and all of our children for our children's moment this Easter. many friends with us this morning. I wish they would come on up. I see them. <laughs> so happy Easter. Um, today we've got a little giveaway for our, our youngest members and friends, and I wanted to read the story that comes with it because it's such a cute little Easter story. Did you know that this little caterpillar will one day become a beautiful butterfly? It all begins with tiny eggs that are attached to a leaf or a stem. A tiny larvae is the first stage of the butterfly. It eats its way out of the shell and continues to eat and grow. The caterpillar stage is next. As it grows, it sheds its skin many times. The chrysalis is the transformation stage where the caterpillar changes into a beautiful butterfly. Then one day, that butterfly emerges it has changed from how it first began. As the butterfly changes, we also change when we believe Jesus is our Savior. He gives us new life in him forever. Jesus has given you new life, and you can show kindness and love to others and share God's good news. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Happy Easter. invite y'all to stand y'all it is a glorious day let's stand and praise the risen king jesus i was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb Till I met you. I know who you are, the 
cross of salvation was only the start. Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future, and it's worth living. I wasn't made, because I wasn't made to be content in a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. Why would I make a bed in my shame? Why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours, and I was made for more. Yeah, I know who I am, cause I know who you are, the cross of salvation.
you to be seated and in the truth that every single one of us has been called by name by the risen Christ let us go to God in prayer this morning let us pray God we come here this morning looking across the horizon And we see that the sun is breaking forth. That the light has dawned after the darkest night. And God, that is what you do time and time again. And it is on this Easter morning that we remember this most precious gift that you have given us, the most precious gift, a gift that promises healing, a gift that promises real hope, real grace and real love in the midst of our lives, God, that feel all too real at times. With all that weighs us down, this is the morning that we celebrate that we do not carry our burdens alone. That the darkness does not have the last word. That death has been overcome. And that you are with us always to the end of all things. And we praise you this morning. God, for Jesus' act on the cross. And for the tomb being empty. We give you thanks. And God, we pray that this Easter morning is a reminder that we don't just celebrate resurrection on this day but that new life and resurrection can happen in us with each new morning, with each new interaction, with every hug, with every smile, with every tear, there is the hope of resurrection because of what was done by you for us. We give you thanks for that. And we give you thanks for our Savior, Jesus, who is forever teaching us how to live, how to love, and how to rise. And so we pray this prayer, the prayer he so faithfully taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Canterbury, you continue to be an incredibly generous congregation. And it is with that generosity that we are able to do all that we do, both within these walls and outside in the community. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds to give back for God's glory.
Well, we as Easter people do indeed have a story like no other. There's just one thing about Easter is, is we kind of already know what happened. We know the story. Even if, if you're not someone who comes to church every single Sunday, even atheists know the story. They can tell us what happens. They can tell us that Jesus was arrested, that Jesus was tried, that Jesus was beaten, that Jesus was put on a cross, that Jesus died. And then this crazy thing happens where Jesus is resurrected no other person in history claims to have ever been resurrected. Most of us hear the, the same story every Easter. Most of the time, it's from John's gospel, and you can probably replay it in your head. Mary goes out in the, in the middle of the night. In fact, John says it's like 3 a.m., and she's so grieved that she goes to the only place where she can get solace, and that's the last place she saw Jesus where he was put in the tomb. And then we see the gardener, and we know that it's beautiful in the garden, and then the gardener calls Mary by name, and all of a sudden she realizes that it's Jesus, right? We know the story. So this Sunday we're not going to read that story, because that's too easy. We're going to read the story from the Gospel of Mark, and it goes something like this. When the Sabbath was over... Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go and tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he's going on ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread. They fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What a great Easter story, am I right? We don't even get the risen Jesus. We don't see the main character. All of you are looking at me like, what in the world? You're ruining my Easter. Just hang with me. It's going to be great. This is my favorite resurrection story. In these eight small verses, there is so much there. So often we can get so focused on the pomp and circumstance of what we expect in Easter. We forget the Savior and the person that we actually get in Jesus. We have the women who have this unrealistic hope when they show up to the tomb. And it's not an unrealistic hope that Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. That is not even in their brains. They have this unrealistic hope that they're going to be able to take these spices and anoint Jesus' body with them. Unrealistic hope because the stone in front of the tomb is large and there's no way that they're going to be able to get it open. So they hope that someone's going to be there who can roll the, way sto the stone away for them. Maybe a Roman soldier who was put there to guard the tomb because they wanted to make sure that Jesus would not get out and that nobody would mess with the body. This is unrealistic because no soldier is going to put his life and his career on the line to roll that stone away, to go against Caesar, to go against Pilate. Not going to happen. But somehow they hope that they're going to be able to take these spices, anoint Jesus with love so that his body won't stink. Because when it came time for him to die, the Sabbath was just about to begin. And so they didn't have time to do the ritual that they would do for the person that they loved most in the world. Unrealistic hope. And when they get there, they see that the stone has been rolled away and they are so confused. Because not only did they really probably not expect that they would be able to get into the tomb, they for sure didn't expect that it would be empty. 
And so what they experience is beyond their wildest dreams, beyond their hopes of all hopes. And in a sense, we think that this might be what makes them afraid. Have you ever gotten exactly what you hoped for and exactly what you wanted? Maybe that's not where you are now, but you can think about that, right? I know that there have been times, I remember when um, John Carl and I wanted to start a family, when I found out that I was pregnant, that is a fulfilled hope that, that I hoped beyond hope would happen. And you know what? I was terrified. Because turns out that as many books that you can read on starting a family or having a pregnancy or having a baby, you still don't know what lies ahead. It's uncharted territory. And so these women are afraid because this is uncharted territory. Never before in the history of the world has someone risen from the dead. Jesus had said this was going to happen, but there was no way that they could possibly fathom it. Just three days before, Mark tells us, three days before, Jesus dies all alone. In Mark's gospel, this is where we get Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he hangs on the cross by himself. The disciples have fled. The women watch from a hill far away. They're not at the foot of the cross like in other gospel tellings. Jesus is utterly alone. And so I'm sure part of this, the women are afraid because they're a little bit ashamed. They weren't there with him. They didn't believe him. Peter denies him three times, and in Mark's gospel, we see him crumple to the ground in crying agony that he has done the exact thing he said he would never do. There's this other weird thing that happens in Mark's gospel. We have this person clothed in white who says, you know, whoops. He says to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised. He isn't there. Look, here's the place where they laid him. This man clothed in white. What, what do we make of that? An angel maybe? Definitely a messenger of God that we get all throughout Scripture. And the first thing, anytime a messenger of God appears, they always say, don't be afraid. But there's this weird thing that happens in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark's gospel. You remember when Jesus begs his disciples to pray and stay up with him just for a little while? The place where Judas tells the, the high priest that the one whom I kiss is the one that you want to arrest, that place? Look what happens. They came and they grab Jesus right when they're going to, right when they're praying, and they arrest him. One of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave, cut off his ear. Jesus responded, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day I was with you, teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. You let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all of the disciples left him. And ran away. You ready for this really weird part? One young man, a disciple, was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, but he left linen cloth behind and ran away naked. See what happens when we read the Bible? We get to see all sorts of cool things that we don't know is there. And you're like, why are you talking about a naked man on Easter? Again, you're ruining Easter. I don't think that this man at the tomb... Is just any ordinary messenger. Because what is the miracle of Easter? Yes, Jesus rises, rises from the dead and we have hope. And, and we know that death is not the last thing and doesn't get the final word. But in this man's life, he restores him. The man who did the worst thing that he could imagine, who, who runs away from Jesus, the disciple, the ones who said that they would never leave Jesus, He's stripped of the only clothing he has on, and he runs away naked. Can you imagine the shame? Can you imagine the embarrassment? Can you imagine the terrible self-talk? And three days later, not only is Jesus risen from the dead, but this disciple is sitting clothed, 
no more shame, no more sorrow. Restored into right relationship with God, the rest of the disciples, society. How beautiful. In Jesus' resurrection, he is restoring relationship. He is restoring the way that this disciple thinks about himself, the way that he thinks about everything. No longer is he naked. No longer is he shamed. He's restored. Maybe some of you are thinking that this has connotations to another story, Genesis. Adam and Eve, you know, disobey God, and all of a sudden they hide, and they realize that they're naked, and they're ashamed, and God comes, and God clothes them, takes their shame away. I don't know about you all, but there have been some times in my life that I've felt some pretty deep shame. Things that I have done, things that I wish I would have done, but I didn't do. We sang earlier that we weren't made to be tending graves. Perhaps the miracle of Easter is that Jesus calls us out of the own graves that we like to tend. Our own shame, our own failed expectations, our own failings, and invites us to sit clothed in our own restoration to live out the gospel message. The messenger goes on now that he has been restored, now that he has been clothed, now that he is no longer sitting in shame, to tell the women to go on to Galilee, okay? Get going. Go to Galilee and tell the disciples, especially Peter, that I'm coming or that Jesus is going to meet them there. Peter, the one who probably feels worse than any of the disciples, Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times. Peter, the one who we last see in Mark's gospel on his knees sobbing because he's done the very thing he said he would never do. No, not me, God. I'll never deny you. No, not me, God. I'm a faithful follower of Jesus. I come to to church on Sundays and I make sure on Easter morning I'm here, but I'll never deny you. And then... What do we do? So go, restore Peter. Tell him, he's restored. He's forgiven. It's a wonderful thing. But what do we do with an Easter story where the women don't do what they're supposed to do? They're supposed to go and tell Peter, but it ends that they said nothing to no one because they were afraid. I love this Easter story. In the Greek, the word that that this scripture ends with is a preposition, however. So even the Greeks had, had good language rules like we do. We don't end sentences in a preposition, right? And so they said nothing to no one because they were afraid. However, dot, dot, dot. That's the end of the book. Anybody seen the movie Inception? kind of like Inception, right? If you haven't seen it, then you know it's about a ring of criminals who are out to steal memories, and the whole time you're in the movie, you don't really know if you're in a dream or if you're in reality, and the end is terrible. People have talked about it for the last two decades, okay? So I'm going to tell you the ending, and you're going to be mad if you haven't seen it. But in the end, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is sitting in his home. He's been back with his family. He's happy-go-lucky. He's got this little totem, and he spins it. And if, if, if the totem falls, he's in reality. If it keeps spinning, he's in a dream. You know how the movie ends? It just spins and spins and spins and spins. So we don't know. The movie ends with a terrible ending just like Mark's gospel. We don't know. Mark is saying... They were terrified, however. You pick up the story. Clearly, this wasn't the end of the story because we're all sitting here today. The women went and did something. They told someone. We know from the other gospels that Jesus appears. But what Mark is saying is that however, you pick up the story. You live it out. We don't get the body of Christ because Mark is giving us an ending that we get to write. What happened to the body of Jesus is 
Look at the life of his followers. Look at your life. That is the ending to Mark's gospel. And it's beautiful because it matters. Because you matter. What Jesus has promised is to always be with us. And for whatever reason, and the people like me and like you. And so Jesus is saying, how are you going to continue my story? How are you going to live the life that I told you to live? And, and when Mark says, go back to Galilee, he's reminding us of the way the gospel starts. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's son, the story of Jesus is just the beginning. We like to think that it started and that it ended, but guess what? It's still going. It's still going in you and in me. So what graves do we need to stop tending? What shame do we need to put aside? What stones do we need to roll away so that Jesus can speak that good news and that life into us so that we can pick up the story where Mark's gospel let off? And some of you are thinking, well, I came here just to, you know, say, Alleluia, he is risen, he is risen indeed, not to pick up the own story. But that's the beautiful thing about the Bible. It is a living thing that invites us into deeper relationship with God so that we can experience the life that Jesus conquered in his death now. That means that we begin, the go back to the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and we start to look at what He did while He was alive, and we start to live like He lived. We don't choose shame. We choose restoration. We don't choose holding on to grudges. We choose forgiveness. We don't choose death. We choose life. We don't choose blame, we choose mercy. That's the stuff of eternal life. That's the stuff of heaven. That's the stuff of Jesus. This word for tomb that we get in the Greek has the same root as the Greek word for memory. Isn't that weird? Word for tomb. And the core word for memory is the same. Languages are awesome. The word we use, the words we use matter. You want to know why we memorialize dead people? This Greek word for memory. And so when the women are asking, who will roll back the stone from the tomb? Who will roll back the stone, the door of our memory? How do we need to begin to remember who Jesus was and what Jesus did, did for us? How do you need to remember your life, who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing for you? Because guess what? A lot of us have memories that may not be leading us to life. Maybe we have memories about this terrible thing hanging over us, this terrible thing that we did. Maybe we have memories about, I don't know what, you fill in your own blank. But how do we begin to remember who God made us to be and what God made us to do? That is the invitation of Easter. Roll back the stone of your memory. Step in to this new life that God has created for you. And maybe, just maybe, God will show up in your midst. Let's pray. Dear God, so often we come to church and we want simple answers and easy fixes. And you never promised us either of those things. What you did promise us is to never leave us, never forsake us. And where we are, you will be there also. And so, God, this Easter morning, even though the story sometimes goes not quite like we expect it to, help to help us remember who you are, who you have called us to be, 
that we aren't people that tend to graves, but we are people that step into new life. We are people who choose peace and mercy and love and forgiveness. And that if this, if this world is to know the resurrected Jesus, it starts with us. In your son's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing together with us one more time um, as we sing and pray these words that we would go and be like Jesus and uh, live out what he has for our lives. So y'all sing with us this morning. to those who run to him place their hope and confidence in Jesus he won't forsake them and blessed are those who seek his face who bend their knees and fix their gaze on Jesus they won't be shaken so come on and praise the
I hope you go from this place knowing that with Jesus, the worst thing is never the last thing. Go knowing that you have been created in love, by love, and for love, and as an Easter people, go and be love to a world who desperately needs it. Happy Easter. Go in peace.